Yes, now, Richard Winters has a mic here. So anybody wants to ask either Edith or myself questions, and we'll divide them up as we think best. If you'll just speak to find him, and uh, speak into the microphone, please, and ask what you want. It doesn't have to be in relationship to what is La Brie, but maybe that would be a good place to start. And then afterwards, you could enlarge it to any, uh, any questions you wanted. So if anybody wants to ask a question, do get hold of Richard. Put up your hand so Richard can come and give you the mic, please. Dr. Schaefer, in the May 19th issue of U.S. News and World Report, you were referred to as a Christian Reconstructionist. I was wondering if you could supply us with the definition of that term, and do you accept that designation? I had no idea what the meaning of it was. <laughs> <laughs> nice I really right hadn't. Nice I read right it over two or three times and couldn't figure out what it meant, so <laughs> put, it, put it aside. This on. Uh, I'd like to ask you two questions. The first one, sir, is how are you feeling and, and as to your general health? And the second one is uh, more substantive and relates to a concern some of us have. You have spent a great deal of your intellectual life in talking about the deficiencies that have come to the Christian faith because it has been wedded to humanistic philosophy, and specifically you've referred to uh, Augustine's wedding, Plato, Aquinas, Aristotle, and the neo-orthodox tradition embracing some of existential thought. I wonder if you would comment on the current tendency for much of your work to be wedded to traditional conservative humanistic political thought. Yes, the, as to the first question, just today I'm terribly tired because we travel all the way from California. Uh, but Edith and I um, really consider a miracle that I'm, that I'm still living and able to work. Um, as for my general health, uh, the doctors four times said I was going to, they thought I would die. But each time the Lord brought me through it. And the, uh, I'm going through a difficult time. I'm in the middle of uh, eight very, very heavy chemotherapy treatments. Just finished the fourth. And the, uh, my dilemma came basically from the fact that uh, I had changed from a small cell lymphoma to a large cell lymphoma without knowing it, which is m much more difficult. So I'm, it, wouldn't, it would be unfair to say that it was easy. It's been very hard. And I've admired Edith very much for taking so much of the weight. But we have decided that uh, in the light of not only my sickness, but other things as well, that it is right for us to change our permanent residence now from Switzerland to Rochester, Minnesota. So we have bought a house there. And that's where we're going. That's going to be our central point. From now on, though, we'll, if the Lord gives me the strength, we'll keep traveling just as we have in the past. As for the other question, what I would just say is if you mean by, when you use the term humanist, if you mean merely conservative viewpoint, uh, I've stressed in the Christian Manifesto and many, many other places uh, that a conservative humanism is no better at all uh, than a liberal humanism. I've made this amply plain. However, in this new book, uh, The Great Evangelical Disaster, I also emphasize, emphasize that which I did at the uh, uh, Evangelical Publishers Association in Minneapolis a year ago, maybe a little less, and that is the fact we must be very careful in the present situation not to be scared off by the use of connotation of words. 
So today, uh, and you'll find it all in the new book, uh, I have it written out there. Today it is true that as soon as you begin to take a, uh, a position of um, confront confrontation, no matter how loving you make the confrontation, instead of accommodation, which I believe has infiltrated the evangelical ranks so thoroughly, uh, as soon as you begin to do this, you begin to get slapped with the connotation of words, no matter how careful you are. So the two terms, the uh, fundamentalist and the new right, <clears throat> that as soon as you, now there is, a, there is a new right to lean against, without any question, or not new right, but right to lean against. At the same time, we must not back off and be afraid to raise our voices in confrontation just because we're slapped then with a connotation of words. Uh, I usually don't use either the word, any of these words for myself. I call myself a Bible-believing Christian and have since the 30s. Uh, but having said this, the connotation of words is used as an instrument to scare us off, and we mustn't back off because of this. This is the way Ken Woodward, for example, in the Newsweek article he wrote about me, uh, used, the word, uh, used the word fundamentalist. He, he did it as a, as a put down. And what I have found is that <clears throat> too many Christians, as soon as they, these terms are slapped on them, they back off in fear. We mustn't do that. We must realize that, of course, there is a right to lean against. Uh, and I've done it all my life, extreme right. But at the same time, at the same time, the evangelical establishment, as I stress in the new book, and we have, we've just come off this series of 11 seminars with Frankie. He had one more. And this is the whole, was the whole, this was our whole thrust. My new book, his new book, and then the film and the seminars. And that is the fact that evangelicalism uh, has been deeply, deeply, deeply infiltrated with the mentality and knee-jerk response of accommodation to everything that comes along. Now, when we begin to speak out for, uh, for, uh, con for a loving confrontation, but confrontation rather than accommodation, because if truth is truth, it demands speaking out. As soon as we do this, we're going to get hit with these connotation words. And we must think it through, what is just, what isn't just, and not be afraid just because these connotation words are used against us, is what I would say. I think this is the real answer to your question. Uh, the question I have is, um, in the Reformation, there not only was the Catholic element and, and the Protestant element, but there was also the Anabaptist element, and that was a very uh, strong element in the Reformation. There is a very strong and outspoken uh, resurgence of Anabaptist viewpoints, especially in the area of uh, nonviolence and a nonviolent uh, response to the world in which we live. And uh, in the area of the book that John Howard Yoder has written called The Politics of Jesus and the issues that are raised in those uh, discussions on the Sermon on the Mount and those kind of things, what would you uh, give us as a, uh, a safe statement of, about the relevance of the politics of Jesus in our, in the pressures of our modern day world with uh, reference to things like uh, nuclear war and that, that sort of thing. What I say is you have to go back and look at the Anabaptists all the way to the beginning. And you're quite right, this was a appreciable element in the Reformation period. Uh, however, as you come to the Mennonites and those who follow in the stream, uh, they make what I consider to be a basic error. And that is, Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek when we're hit in the face. And I just say to all of us, surely, none of us do this sufficiently. 
no, no, none of us in this room, sufficiently turn the other cheek. But they have always made what I consider and what a lot of other people do as well, but it's definitely my opinion, an unwarranted, a very unwarranted extension. And that is also saying the state should never use force to protect its people. And this is a very unwarranted ex extension. And I think the root of it comes really from not emphasizing sufficiently the fallenness of this world. So consequently what you have is a projection, of a, a utopian projection. Uh, and you can get that in Ron Sider's books and some of these others. A, uh, a, very much of a utopian projection uh, that in the present geopolitical situation in the world, for example, uh, that we should let down our guard entirely against, uh, against the Soviet bloc and uh, even, uh, even uh, almost invite the Soviet forces into the United States with flowers in our guns. Now, no, this is truly, this has been said. Now, I think, I think that utopianisms in a fallen world always bring disaster, any utopianism because we live in a fallen world. And if anybody would ask me what I think is maybe the greatest weakness of many, many Christians is that they simply, they might fight like mad against the liberal theologian uh, for the first three chapters of Genesis, including the fall, theologically. But I would just say from my experience, most Christians don't live realistically in the light of the fall. And I would switch it from your question for a moment. Uh, when, when I go into one of the hospitals, there's two hospitals connected with Mayo Clinic and talk to somebody who has just found, the Christian has found they've just found they've had cancer. Uh, and the question comes, why has this happened to me? The thing, the answer, uh, certainly the most basic answer, the most important answer, is to remind them of the fall, that we live in a fallen world. There's lots of things in this world we don't like. I don't like my concert. I just don't like it. But on the other hand, I have to live with it in the light of reality on the basis of a fallen cause and effect world. Now, the, I feel this is the, the uh, of tremendous danger uh, at the present moment in the evangelical ranks. There are several issues which stand out as, as central. And again, I would urge you to take the book and go over it carefully because I spelled them out there. The places where the world spirit of our day has infiltrated the evangelical ranks. And the most uh, crucial of these is uh, letting down in much of the evangelical circles, uh, in many of them, of the uh, uh, concerning scripture. The scripture is now taken and viewed in many evangelical seminaries, unhappily, and we ran into it in our seminars, uh, the Israeli scripture is looked at in the neo-Orthodox way, or the existential methodology, however you want to express it. Uh, another is a matter of human life, uh, that the evangelical circles have been extremely weak in providing leadership in fighting for uh, a unique value of human life extremely weak. Our, our journals, our, uh, our evangelical leadership has simply not provided it. But an another one of these would be in this area, I think, of a utopian view of the geopolitical situation so that it leads to a pacifism and it leads to such, uh, such things of unilateral disarmament as a freezer, we won't shoot first, this whole type of thing. And I would just say when the peace churches, the Mennonites and so on, uh, put this forward, it's not surprising because it's been their historic position. If, on the other hand, they and the liberal theologians who unite at this point, because the liberal theologians are all on this side too, but for different reasons, uh, if they had their way and could influence government policy uh, in this direction, I think it'd be a terrible tragedy. But when, uh, and what it does is violate to me the law of love. Those people behind the Iron Curtain deserve our love. And it's a terrible thing to play down their persecution, the Christian's persecution. And it's a terrible thing to turn our back on Europe 
uh, and the just turn it over to the uh, Soviet expansionism. But when the evangelical uh, begin to fall into the same rank, I personally think it's not only a tragedy, but it's something that we must uh, actively speak out against. So this is my position. Schaefer, I'm a, a member of a very liberal denomination now and have spoken out a number of times with regard to trying to return to evangelical thought. And one of the concerns or uh, been trying to figure out what kind of criteria with a lot of prayer and a lot of uh, thought being given whether a person should stay in a liberal church uh, or should change and go to a more evangelical and Bible-believing church. Can you give any assistance with the criterion? Or? Yeah, I would say it's a matter of individual conscience, but I couldn't be in a liberal denomination. I just couldn't. I left the big Pres Northern Presbyterian Church back in the 30s with at the time of Machen and the other men, and I'm glad I, had, I'm glad I did. Because all these liberal denominations get continually worse. And I would say the, I would say the, uh, uh, it's very interesting. If you take the people who stayed in those denominations back in the 30s, they never, never would have visualized that in the liberal denominations today they would be out speaking so blatantly in favor of abortion. Uh, it could be considered a victory to not have women uh, uh, and homo uh, lesbians and homosexuals ordained. Uh, the thing has changed with remarkable speed. Well, that isn't quite true because it's been 50 years. But having said this, I would just say it's still a matter of individual conscience. But there's one thing I think isn't a matter of individual conscience, and that is when it becomes impossible to bring discipline against the validly liberal uh, pastors and theological seminary teachers in the denomination, when the possibility of discipline comes completely to an end, I, I don't believe that uh, it can, it's possible after that to stay in these denominations without thinking through what you've accepted. What you've accepted, if you stay in them then, after discipline, is, is completely ruled out. For instance, in the big northern Presbyterian church in a, in a California presbytery, they have just, have just accepted Professor Hicks from England uh, in the, uh, as a pastor. And he, after all, he's written a book speaking in the myth, uh, mythology of Jesus. He believes the thing of Jesus is a complete myth, yet he's accepted in the, in the, uh, uh, in the presbytery as good and regular member of the presbytery. Now, when you've, you will have to see then what you've done uh, is when you stay in a long, long time after discipline, no longer is possible. What you've accepted is a perpetual pluralistic church a church in which uh, liberals and Bible-believing Christians are supposed to live together forever. And this, it seems to me, is impossible. Just impossible. Where every, all the central things of the faith uh, are, are accepted. So I, I, I would come back to the starting place. It's a matter of individual conscience. And I've never, I don't urge people to come out of liberal denominations, though I could not be in them. But I would lay upon any Bible-believing Christian in a liberal denomination that when, the, when it becomes impossible to have discipline against those who quite openly uh, disavow the central things of the faith, you've accepted in a, the church of Christ uh, to be confused with the world. And the church is not the world. The church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it mustn't be accepted uh, just the way we understand that the world is a mixed bag. So be careful what you're doing. And I'd say don't be in a hurry, but pray about it. Think it through. But you see, I think the emphasis, as I again say in the new book, is on the purity of the visible church. And there is a call for, uh, in the Bible for the purity of the visible church, the visible church. Uh, there's a call to that. The church is not the world, as I've said. Uh, and when it becomes impossible to have discipline, no matter how gross the unbelief, then what you're really doing is saying, I'm going to set the whole concept of the purity of the visible church aside, 
And instead of that, we'll have a pluralistic church forever. So, uh, Doc. Is this still going? <laughs> I'd like to say one further thing. Um, I've just been struck again with the uh, need of relaying truth to the next generation, whether your own children who are going to church with you or other people's children whom you are drawing there, if you are teaching a good class, they're coming there and joining in and so forth. I've been struck very recently again with the responsibility um, in having a, a, a fellow come, a, a boy, a college student, come to the Labri in Rochester. Uh, he was one who sat eating my sandwiches I spoke of making <laughs> earlier uh, a few sun couple Sunday nights ago. He spoke of um, being very serious in his asking questions in a Presbyterian college that he is attending um, of his his Bible teacher, his, his uh, uh, religion teacher, I guess he is called, asking questions concerning the atonement of Christ, what all this was about, and so on. And very obviously, I won't give all the answers, but they were shocking. The man did not believe at all uh, that Christ was the Son of God, nor that his atonement was, was an atonement, nor that we needed an atonement. And he had a very dim view uh, of anything concerning sin or the need of, of uh, salvation. This boy was, um, was upset and uh, needed to have help in giving answers. Someone else who, who would not be upset enough to go out and search for answers would simply be lost. Um, I would speak of that, that aspect um, of responsibility to the next generation, we're told to tell our children and our children's children uh, the truth concerning God, and we're to expose them to the truth. So that is an aspect that I think is very serious. Is this on? Yeah, Mrs. Schaefer, I want to thank you for uh, your writings. They've meant a lot to my wife and myself, and they always help me when it comes around time for gifts, because you're such a prolific writer. Every Christmas, birthday. <laughs> Uh, I have something on hand, and uh, in the first year of our marriage, we used to, after dinner, uh, we'd re read together, What is a Family?, and it has uh, had a real positive effect. Dr. Schaefer, I'm a product of uh, what you once called the new super spirituality, the Jesus movement, and many other things, uh, and discovered your works. They meant, uh, have influenced me uh, a great deal, and moved from that into uh, graduate school and now teaching English in, in a college setting. And one of the things I enjoyed and uh, opened a new avenue for me uh, in your works was the examination of uh, cultural phenomena such as uh, film, uh, literature, art, from the Christian perspective. And you talked about, uh, I don't, this, these weren't your words, but the trickle-down effect, in a sense, from philosophy down into the arts uh, over periods of time, uh, such that, so that existentialism you saw in uh, mu much of what you spoke about uh, and wrote about in the 60s. And, and what we were seeing in film, reading, seeing on television. Uh, what do you see, uh, what is trickling down through the film, films, the literature, the art of today, uh, even literary theory such as deconstructionism? Uh, what, do you, what is your comment today about uh, the cultural events of our society and what philosophically uh, is behind them? Yes, I think you have to couch everything in your thinking if you're going to understand the world spirit that surrounds us. In the realization that today people do not believe in truth. The concept of truth, what I call true truth in my books, meaning absolute truth, which is truth for everybody and not just personalized truth, not just I have my truth, you have your truth. The concept of absolute truth is really gone today. Uh, you can see it in the philosophy, in the schools of philosophy, in that after the death of logical positivism, when Polanyi killed that, and the uh, and existential, a uh, formal existential philosophy, there is no dominant philosophy today uh, being taught. It's very esoteric. Every, every philosophy teacher has his own philosophy. And the... Uh, 
what we've come to then in philosophy uh, is, the, uh, is the fact that there is no basic philosophy giving a uh, dominant uh, position, uh, a floor from which there comes a trickling down or however you want to word it. Now, this, however, and however, this has caught on very much out into general thinking. So while existentialism as existentialism is no longer taught as a, a very dynamic philosophy, which is uh, it was on the continent a certain number of years ago, really, I think, unless we who are Christians understand that everybody today, everybody, of course, is always strong, but close to that, everybody is thinking existentially. Unless we feel that, our uh, understanding of what surrounds us and our children, and therefore the danger of infiltration by it. And on the other hand, a weakness of evangelism if we don't understand it. Because when I come up to a people, to, real people today, some people have thought it through, some have just been influenced on a more superficial basis, and I say Christianity is true. Now that means something to us if we're really Christians. But for a real 20th century person, it doesn't mean what it means to us. Because it doesn't mean I'm saying Christianity is true as an absolute, but it's a truth that works for me. So what you have today, what we're surrounded by on every side, is the factor of a loss of a concept of truth. Now this is what is influencing, I would say, the cultural setting. and. Uh, that would be everything from high art uh, to uh, architecture today, uh, to theology, uh, to, uh, to what you see on your TV screens. You have to face this. And it is the thing which is very much infiltrated. Again, the evangelical ranks and accommodation, uh, that this idea of the existential metho methodology. Now, remember how I define the existential methodology, and that is that uh, that using reason, coming out of the French Enlightenment and then is developed in Germany uh, through their philosophers in, in the 18th century and the 19th century, uh, that instead of reason being high and great and optimistic and being able to, uh, to uh, solve everything, instead of that, they saw a limitation to reason, which of course it has, human reason, as people are finite. Uh, and therefore, you look for your answers in the area of non-reason. Those of you all the way back to my book, Escape from Reason, will remember my emphasis on that. Now, that's exactly where we're living today. Exactly where we're living today. And there's a trickle-down, uh, more than a trickle-down. The, the, things, the, the things sustain each other. Uh, the thought of the people who are trying to think deeply are thinking in this area. The cultural things sustain it. And we're faced with this on every side. And again, coming back to what is my tremendous burden at this moment in our uh, world of the United States and other places too, but especially here, of infiltration into the evangelical ranks. It's exactly the thing that is being taught in the seminary, the seminary, uh, semi, uh, seminaries that are drifting in this direction, moved in this direction, now hold this position in regard to the Bible. And that is simply that the Bible has lots of mistakes in it, but you believe it anyway, religiously. And uh, this can be transferred not only into theological realms, uh, but into many, many others. So if you take a magazine like Christianity Today, uh, they present both sides of the question. Then they walk away. There's no leadership there for what is right and wrong, even on an issue as clear as abortion. Uh, you present both sides of the case, and you walk away. And they may not know it. I'm not saying they consciously realize that they have accommodated, but they have accommodated to the, to the mentality of our age. And the, uh, the mentality of our age is there is no such thing as truth. And as I open the open the book, uh, The Great Evangelical Disaster, I point out that what we have come to, and it's overwhelmed us in this country, is that everyone wants to have total freedom for themselves. 
They want to totally have freedom individually for themselves. Why? Because there is no truth. And it's our problem, problem with the Supreme Court. Uh, they rule this way. There's no real basis for their law. There's only sociological law. It's on every side. And those of you who have studied my book carefully, uh, How Should We Then Live, will remember that in it, it wasn't specifically a, uh, speaking against abortion, though it did that too, but pointing out that uh, in the growth of thought up into our age, uh, that the, uh, the abortion ruling, the uh, concern that the Supreme Court gave, was a perfect example of sociological law, that it was totally arbitrary, both medically and uh, also uh, legally. But this is everywhere today. So I think what we ought to see, you remember, we ought to see is that the, uh, that we're not dealing with just bits and pieces. I began the Christian Manifesto, you remember, uh, with the factor that Christians are disturbed gradually by bits and pieces. But they don't realize that it's all of one piece. And uh, the basic problem is that if you accept what is now taught by law, and nothing else can be taught in our public school system in the United States. And that is that the final reality is only energy, which has existed forever in some form and has its present form by chance. Then this is a silent universe. It gives no, it gives no basis for value systems, no basis for law, no basis for an intrinsic value of human life. But more profound is what I've just been talking about, and that is it gives no basis for truth. None whatsoever. There is no truth. So this is the age we live in and the age we have to fight against for infiltration, but it's all the, also the age we, into which we have to evangelize. So if we're going to really understand what evangelization means, uh, and no one stresses the need of accepting Christ as Savior more than we do, and we do in La Brea, um, the, uh, in order to be saved, the... What you must realize is that if you're going to really evangelize with, and be knowledgeable about it today, you have to, have to understand those to whom you're speaking so you can talk to them in a way they understand. And the basic thing is uh, that they, they, it's an age which on one hand has no basis for truth whatsoever. And that's first of all a knowledge even before a value system. And then secondly, uh, an age in which therefore it is therefore, notice the word therefore, uh, everyone demands autonomous freedom. Autonomous freedom to kill my child before it is born. Autonomous freedom to kill my child after if it's born, if it doesn't come up to someone's standard of life. Autonomous freedom in the whole works. And of course this stands, in conclusion I'd say this stands in complete contrast and antithesis to the Christian position in which the final reality is an infinite personal God who exists, to whom not everything is the same, who has graciously told us what his character is in the Bible, and that there is such a thing as truth and absolutes and a basis for law and intrinsic value of human life. So the question you've asked, where are you, the one who asked the question? Yeah, well, the question, the question you asked is profound, I think, and it comes across in the cultural areas as well. There is no dominant school of art today, for example, or architecture, or anything else. It's, it's trickled down in this area very much in our own day, and uh, as well as back in the 60s. Could you speak to the issue of how a Christian can evangelize in a world that is so hodgepodge? It's, it's easy to break down a wall that is a solid substantive thing. For instance, if, if, if a, a, a prospective a convert had a particular block that he would set before you, before you could, uh, uh, shall we say, continue with uh, the gospel presentation, it, it's easy to work against that one thing, but when they just sort of dodge you from one place to the other, well, you know, maybe that's right for you, and, and uh, that's how you understand it, but I don't understand it that way, therefore it's not binding upon my conscience. The concept of absolute truth, again, entering into that. 
his refusal to accept the concept of absolute truth. How do you, how do you nail a person down, uh, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. I would, say, I would say we must realize there's two ways of evangelism. One is mass evangelism, and people sometimes think I must, uh, and we must be opposed to that uh, because we do not do the, uh, go in the direction of mass evangelism, but we're not opposed to it. I'm not opposed to it, as long as the gospel content is clearly given. Uh, because we can be thankful, but we have a very gracious God. And uh, people who are, we can be thankful, overwhelmingly thankful, for people who are saved, no matter how they're saved, we can be glad. Uh, but having said this, I do believe that for the age in which we live, a great number of people, if they're going to be reached with real content, need individual attention, is what I would say. Now, we, let's, let's analyze for a moment. Why, why should we become a Christian at all? And I'd say this to all of us. And I, I would emphasize, and it's, it grows on me with an always intensified strength the older I live, that there's only one reason to be a Christian and not two. And that is because it's truth. There is no other reason to be a Christian. The, the reason to be a Christian is not because it gives you butterflies in your stomach on Sunday morning. That's not the reason. The reason for being a Christian is because it's true. And when we in La Brie say it is true, we're not just talking about it being religiously true. We're talking about it being true to all reality. In other words, if you don't have the Bible, if you don't have the Bible and you don't uh, act upon it, it isn't only that you don't know how to escape hell and go to heaven. You do that happily out of the Bible. But it's also true that we don't know without the Bible, we wouldn't know not only uh, who God is, but we wouldn't know who people are. That's what's wrong with our generation. That's why it's accepted the abortion thing and the infanticide thing and the euthanasia thing so, so quickly and with such a flood. It's because they don't know who people are. Uh, I don't know if you saw the uh, Time editorial uh, the Time editorial a short time ago called Thinking Animal Thoughts. Uh, and it did so much better, uh, I, so much better than most of our evangelical magazines did in dealing with this. Because what they said was, this non-Christian, that if you take away the biblical, the biblical view of who God is and man being made in his image, then there is no basis for a distinction between human life and other forms of life. You only have two, two, qualif two distinctions. One is non-life and one is life. And then he carried it out quite properly to its extension. And then there's, why not perform abortion? Why not perform experimentation on embryos? Or what right does the human race have to perform experimentation on animals for the human race is good if the human race is of the, only the same qualification of life? This man really understood the game, much better than most Christians seem to understand it. What I'm saying is, without the Bible, it isn't just that you don't know how to go to heaven, but without the Bible, you don't know who people are. You have no knowledge. You don't know what this world is. Uh, when you watch the birds fly across the sky, if you really don't have the Bible to tell you uh, that uh, who created this world and what the world is, uh, even the birds flying across the sky is very, very different. We have many people come to La Brie who has thought this out to the very end properly, and that is that there's no meaning to life, no meaning to individual life, no meaning to all of human life. They're not wrong, they're right. The younger generation who grabbed the needle and shoot it up simply because uh, they can't find any meaning to life. They're not wrong, they're right. In the sense that uh, if you take the Bible away, uh, it isn't only that people are lost for eternity, and I believe people go to hell if they don't accept Christ as Savior, but they're lost now. They have no meaning to life. And we who are Christians who live in our own little ghettos and don't think out and think, how, how do these people think? What does it really mean to take the Bible away? 
Now, when we come, when we come therefore, to the question of evangelism, uh, the, the dilemma is uh, getting across to people uh, the, the full meaning, uh, the content of what Christianity teaches. And as some of you have heard me say before, uh, Christianity does not begin with accept Christ as Savior. Christianity begins where the Bible begins, and that is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's where it really begins. Without that, the word accept Christ as Savior uh, and I, is only one more trip. That's all. Now, I would say to you then in the practical things, the practical question you've asked, that uh, while it is true that people are saved uh, with mass evangelism, and we must be thankful for everybody who is saved, yet uh, in the age in which we live, the danger of the response in mass evangelism is that they don't understand enough content. They just don't. They're responding, there's a response there, and I'm not saying they aren't saved, that's between them and the Lord. But uh, at the same time, when we come down to the individual, we must go back to the beginning of the problem. Therefore, it takes time. And when I would, uh, if somebody is, uh, even if I were on an airplane and I only had an hour to speak to the man or woman in the seat beside me, I would never begin with just accept Christ as Savior. I talk about the difference that Edith stresses so well, and that is the difference between a personal and an impersonal universe. That's where I would begin, even if I only had an hour. And point out that if this impersonal universe is the final reality, this thing that is, as I say now, unhappily, is the only view that can be taught legally in the American public schools, uh, the only view, that then it follows quite logically and naturally that there's no meaning to life. Not just hell. Uh, I wouldn't begin with quoting Bible verses to them, uh, though in certain cases, the, uh, I would certainly quote Bible verses. But for the real 20th century person beside me in the airplane seat, uh, I would go back rather to their dilemma if they hold the modern world view of the final reality being only energy, etc. I would start with that. Uh, I would begin as I stressed in the God who is there way back uh, all those years ago, almost 20 years ago. I guess it is 20 years ago now, close to it anyway. Uh, I would talk to them about their own prophets who really show where their view goes. Uh, for instance, Jacques Monneau, uh, he was a Nobel Prize biologist in France. He's dead now, but he was. And he wrote a book a number of years ago, I don't know how many now, called Chance and Necessity. And in it, he very strongly subscribed to this view that the final reality is only energy, et cetera, et cetera, and shaped by chance. But he has a sentence in that book that says it very, very well. He accepts the conclusion, and that is on the basis that this is the only final reality, and this is his sentence. There's no way to tell the ought from the is. In other words, you live in a totally silent universe. And it isn't only uh, the question of individual morals, Though I must say, I'm amazed in the last uh, hmm, five years that when you flip on the TV set, we really see we live in Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, the stuff that's on the TV, uh, TV now, uh, 20 years ago, you'd have to go up some dark alley to see if you had one to see. We, the whole thing has crumbled away. Now, a man like Jacques Monod or Jean-Paul Sartre, whoever the man might know that you're talking to, that's his prophet, and they point out quite properly and conclusively what life is like, not just heaven and hell, because naturally they don't believe in that, but they point out quite naturally and clearly exactly where all this leads. Now, to me, this is the way to evangelize the 20th century person. And we must say in La Brea, and it's been one of the great marks of Labrie that we've dealt this way, that happily through the years in the various branches, 
we have seen literally thousands of people accept Christ as Savior who normally wouldn't accept Christ as Savior if they only heard the gospel preached as it often is preached because they wouldn't see it as viable. They wouldn't see it as worth listening to. Because you must realize that modern man is confronted with two deaths. Uh, this wasn't true when I was younger. It's happened in my own lifetime. Uh, people have always been afraid of physical death. And this has always been one of the great motivations to listen to what the Bible has to say. Quite properly, people ought to be afraid of physical death uh, if they're not uh, saved. Because there is a heaven and there is a lostness. But modern man is caught with a second death because modern man has thought through his conclusions further than previously. And that is, modern man also believes that life is a product of pure chance, human life, uh, pure chance, and that one day this planet will either grow too hot or too cold. And when it grows too hot or too cold, all conscious life will pass away upon this planet. That's really, the whether people realize it or not, one of the great drives toward all the modern, uh, modern uh, enthusiasm for E.T. and Close Encounters and all the other films. And they realize very much this. Then you have to add to that, uh, that thou, though it wouldn't make any difference at all to Christianity if there was life somewhere else in the cosmos, yet, nevertheless, there is no proof that there's life anywhere else in the cosmos. E.T., Close Encounters, all this rash of uh, outer space business, it's all purely uh, based, on, it's, it's based on thin air. There's no empirical proof whatsoever there's life anywhere else in the cosmos. Now, remember what I said, though, it wouldn't make any difference to Christianity if there were. But uh, there's not any proof. Therefore, if we have only to look down in my own lifetime to the time when I get to be 70 or 80 or something, and I die, and that's the end of me, and I'm going nowhere. And if the whole human race is going down the road, so that somewhere down the road uh, there'll be no conscious life left on this planet, modern man faces a double death, therefore. An individual death and a cosmic death. Now, this is a point, and, uh, uh, and therefore, then there's feedback in no, meaning, uh, no meaningfulness uh, in the present life. Now, to me, these are the points of, uh, of uh, uh, real contact for the 20th century person. So if people accept Christ as Savior on a, a, a more simplistic basis, we can be thankful. But we have to recognize that uh, what kind of an age we live in, as I say, there is no truth to a modern man, no meaningfulness of life. Uh, everybody, according to modern man, everybody's living out some kind of a game plan, whether it's knocking one-tenth of a second off your downhill ski run or whether it's making one more million dollars. But all you're doing is making a game plan within the midst of a meaningless situation and Woody Allen exploits this very strongly in his films. He really, he really lives in this area. I, I feel for that man. And he's expressed it so thoroughly in uh, Annie Hall and Manhattan and so on. Now, when you come to this, then, you come to this, you must realize this is where modern man is logically. Uh, and we should, be, we should understand that Christianity does not just solve the simpler problems, but Christianity beginning with a statement that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then a real fall, a real fall, and then the solution in Christ Jesus. So we have the metaphysical answer of being in the fact that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We have the moral answer in that now that we all sin uh, in the death of Christ, we should recognize that Christianity is, uh, isn't, a very, isn't a small message. It's a very dynamic message, an exciting message. And this should be, as I see it, the basis of our evangelism. So I hope it, it isn't a matter of being so complicated. When I deal with a very simple person uh, who still has a feeling of right and wrong, and these other things, and still has some kind of a Christian memory, 
And then the, uh, when I deal with them, or when I deal with the real 20th century person, as I've just described, when you get down to the end of it, you're saying the same message in the same words. It isn't that it's a more complicated message. It's that God exists in contrast to his not existing. It's a very definite God. He's an infinite personal God to whom not all things are the same. He has a character. It is, so there are absolutes in this world. It is the fact that we live in a fallen world, as I said before, and we must take the fall seriously in all of the elements of life and not live in a romanticism and a utopianism. And then I look at myself, and I'm a sinner. And I know I've de done deliberately those things that I know to be wrong. And then how do I approach this, this God who exists? Well, in his graciousness, he has is, he is supplied the way through the propitiation uh, of uh, with death, of the death of Jesus Christ uh, on the cross. So the message is all there. The interesting thing is, if you're dealing with a very simple person, and you're dealing with the most complicated a complicated person you will ever meet. When you get done, you give the same message in the same words. But we've got to be careful with our evangelism not to leave out the majority of the people who surround us. 